thank you to all of you for making the time to be here this afternoon. I realise in discussions with Charlie that some of you may be on your own at home, but many of you may in fact be sitting watching this as small groups in your labs. Uh, I understand that you have, as many of us do at the moment, the challenge of working in, in lab shift patterns. So well done to all of you for persevering with that. I, I imagine it's, it's probably one of the more difficult things you've had to dance with among many things in this strangest of years. This title needs some explanation before I, I say anything else. Um, what I'll share with you at the end is, if you like, part one of this brand new seminar that you're seeing uh, at Oxford today. I haven't delivered this anywhere else. No one else has seen this. Uh, I prepared this today for you. But it is part of a, a bigger story. And I'll share a link to part one of what is now part two uh, right at the end. Uh, what I'm doing for you today actually is focusing on one small part within one very well-known mental health challenge that we could argue is actually rather overrepresented in our sector, that being academia. But getting more into the introduction of what we're talking about today, this is a very brief overview of everything that I've done in the past 15 years or so. From 2006, when I first walked through the doors of the university for the first time, up until now, I've worked in a lot of different universities, several different companies, seen a lot of different cultures. And the real privilege of all of that has been to see many different countries and people along the way. But right at the heart of the rest of the story today is the fact that each and every move that I have made has been one that has made me feel like a little fish jump, jumping from a little pond or a little tank into a bigger tank or a bigger pond with bigger fish, scarier fish, and fish that I think are a lot better than I am. And I sort of giggle past that because I'm actually very nervous in saying that out loud every time that I do. Every step I've made, I've felt nervous because I've always compared myself to other people and assumed that they're going to be better than I am. And one thing I want to get across here is that that feeling is like focusing on what I know and thinking everyone else knows more. And it's less like the truth, which is this, that what I know is complementary to what my friends, colleagues and collaborators know. And that's the same for all of us. What we know is complementary to what others know. And this for this brand new seminar today is really the in a nutshell definition I want to give you of the imposter phenomenon or what's commonly but incorrectly referred to as the imposter syndrome, the feeling that you don't belong, the feeling that you're going to be found out, chucked out of the job and that people will point the finger at you as not being qualified to be where you are. It's that fear that sticks with you that is what we call the imposter phenomenon. And that brings me to the first thing I want you to consider today. Now, I, we're not going to do a formal poll as such, but what I do want you to think about is this one very specific question. So I'll read it out to you just in case you can't see it on the screen that you have. I often compare my abilities to those around me and I think they might be better than I am. Now, that's a statement that you can agree or disagree with on a scale shown on one to five here. So you can, if you pick one, that's strongly disagree. You don't think that's true of you at all. Then up to disagree. Three is neither agree nor disagree. Up to four and five, which is agree or strongly agree that this um, is really part of how you see things. Now, if I can, I'm going to also bring up the chat in case anyone wants to participate in this. But have a think about that question for a minute before we move on. I often compare my abilities to those around me and think they might be better than I am. Is that something that you would disagree with or agree with? Where is it that you think you lie on the scale of agreement with that particular question? And whether you want to answer it now or really just think about it, this is actually one of many questions that we've asked and the study that Charlie mentioned that I'm, uh, we've been conducting over the past year or so, 
mentioned, the one that Charlie mentioned right at the start. And I've picked out this one question of many because it's the one really that captures the feeling for today, talking about comparisons in particular. So I'm going to move on at this stage, but do keep that question in your mind. Do you compare your abilities to those around you? And do you think that other people are better than you are? What you can see in this slide now is actually some of the real data, a, a, a thin slice actually of the data that we've captured on our own imposter phenomenon study. And what you can see in that graph is actually data related to the question that I've just pressed upon you. And remember that on this scale on the x-axis here, one through five, one is strongly disagree, up to five is strongly agree. The y-axis is simply the frequency or the number of people who have answered in that particular fashion. And hopefully you can see right away here that our data seems to be dominated by people who feel very, very strongly that they compare themselves to other people and often think that those people are better than they are. So I mentioned I'm very, very nervous saying this of myself, but I'm clearly not alone in feeling that way. And there's a lot of people out there in the hundreds and close to the thousands for us now who we've evidenced as saying very, very similar things. Everyone's experience is individual, but this feeling of comparing ourselves to other people is common more so than it is uncommon. So that has all really been to warm up a promise that I want to make to you for the rest of this seminar. What I want to do is do my very best to tell you some stories that connect to these four rather strange images that I've just put up on the screen. The 1927 Solvay Conference of Physicists, World War II pilots, a three Michelin star chef, and the arguably terrible Christmas movie Deck the Halls with Danny DeVito and Matthew Broderick. Now these seem hopefully wildly different, but I hope by the end of these stories that I'm about to tell you that you can see why all of these things are connected. And what I want to do through connecting these things is give you three tools, three ways of managing this feeling of comparison that has really consumed me over that roughly 15 year period of my career and things now that I consider a lot in terms of helping me move on to the next stage, whatever stage that happens to be, to procrastinate less, to worry less and to fear less. And the first of those three things is to consider that not everything that counts can be counted. And to think about that, the fact that not everything that counts can be counted, that is what takes us to the first of those four rather separate images. Here is the colorized version of the, the, the conference photograph from the 1927 Solvay conference. Many of you will indeed recognize this, but if you don't, you will certainly recognize some of the names of the scientists in this photograph. Many of the people here laid the foundations of 20th century physics, which have then, you might argue, trickled down into the foundations of what we can now do in chemistry. People in this photograph include the likes of Schrödinger, Langmuir, Debye. We've also got Einstein and Lorentz, Marie Curie, Niels Bohr, and others, and at least some of those names will be familiar to you. What I would like to argue is that many of you probably don't know this person who was in the conference photo. This gentleman, a physicist like the others, is Paul Ehrenfest. Here's another photograph of Paul Ehrenfest. And one of the things that he reflected on, not only at this conference, but in letters and dialogue with the students in his care was this. Every new issue of the physical review immerses me in blind panic. My boys, I know absolutely nothing. That was Paul Ehrenfest showing some vulnerability with his students and reflecting on how he feels amongst his contemporaries 
at this really pivotal stage in early 20th century physics. He is comparing himself to those around him. And you can clearly see here that in reading their contributions to the literature, he feels pretty terrible about that. But we can go further, because if we pick out Paul Ehrenfest next to some of the other contributors to this conference, Ehrenfest did things like uh, chaired debates between giants such as Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. And it was in acts like this that he watched in real time what he believed were people that to whom he compared himself and people that he thought were much, much better than he was. And he thought their contributions were much better than his. It entirely consumed him. And you can see that this man is really in amongst the thick of it with the rest of them. This is a, a lovely image of Paul Ehrenfest at the piano and Einstein sitting with Paul's, uh, I, th I believe it's his oldest son. And when Einstein himself reflected on Paul Ehrenfest's contributions, he said this, he was not merely the best teacher in our profession to aid anyone embroiled in inner or outer struggles to encourage youthful talent. All this was his real element, almost more than his immersion in scientific problems. That's Albert Einstein calling out the fact that Paul Ehrenfest was not just a great scientist, but an exquisitely articulate teacher, better than anyone else that Einstein himself had come across. Now that is lofty praise indeed, I hope you would agree with that. But still, no matter what anyone said to Paul Ehrenfest about such abilities, this is a message that went in one ear and out the other. It didn't come across for him. And in fact, the problems went deeper still because the professorship that Ehrenfest was appointed to was one to take over from the esteemed scientist Hendrik Lorentz. And uh, Ehrenfest is documented as saying constantly that he never ever felt worthy of taking up such a chair in place of such a giant scientist who had come before him. So his comparisons were not just to those in his age peer group, let's say, but also to those and generations before him. He was utterly consumed by these comparisons between his ability and other scientists in his group. And the story does unfortunately get darker still because this is what he said next much later on. It has become ever more difficult for me to follow the developments in physics with understanding. After trying ever more drained and torn I have finally given up in desperation. This has made me weary of life. Now, as desperately sad as that sounds, there's good reason for it. Because in fact, that was one of the things that Paul Lennon first wrote in a suicide note. Such was, such was the depth of his depravity and these thoughts of comparison and amongst many other struggles in his life that he decided that he couldn't cope with it and took his own life in 1933. He couldn't think that his contributions might not be in Nobel Prizes or certain elements of lit literature contribution, of which, by the way, he had many, not just in physics, but also in chemistry. But his thoughts maintained that he wasn't as good as the others around him. He couldn't see that not everything that counts can actually be counted. And the story continues now because part two, the second tool that I want to impress upon you is also that not everything that can be counted actually counts. And to tell this second part of the story, to connect us to another one of the four disparately and uh, separate and partly unconnected images that I showed at the start, is to take you to this small part of the world here. About a three hour drive southeast of Paris, there's a small town, a provincial town called Solieu. And by the way, I apologize now for my terrible pronunciation of French and other languages throughout, but I will try my very best. But nonetheless, this next part of the story takes us to this small town, Solieu, southeast of Paris. 
And it's there that you would find this magnificent hotel and restaurant complex named after its chef, Bernard Lazo. It was for many years a, a three Michelin star establishment. And from the 1970s, when Bernard was getting his career off the ground, he fantasized and was razor sharp focused in his drive to obtain what he saw was the pinnacle of his possible achievements. That was to follow in his mentor's footsteps and achieve not one Michelin star for his cooking and his restaurant business, but the full possible three, the highest accolade that he saw that he could possibly achieve. And by the early 90s, he had done it. He had won three Michelin stars. He had done everything he ever dreamed of. But still, he compared himself to chefs around him. And after many, many years at the top, not just in his business, but having deals with various companies and on French TV, this man became a, a real superstar. But despite all of that, he couldn't see it that way. And in the early 2000s, many in the sector were beginning to wonder if he would maintain three stars. And that in itself haunted him greatly. He had meetings with uh, the Michelin establishment itself and it wasn't made clear to him whether or not his three stars were safe. But not only that, around the same time, a competing guide had been looking at uh, Bernard Loiseau's main restaurant and taken it from a very, very high 19 out of 20 score and knocked two points off it to 17 out of 20, which he saw as horrific but is actually still a very, very good score. But more than that, the comparisons came thick and fast at this time with other superstar chefs or established chefs, the likes of Mark Verat, the man on the far right, Michel Troigois, who was the, the son of one of Bernard Loiseau's mentors and the, 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 the real giant and French cooking Paul Bocuse, who had been at the top three Michelin stars longer than most others. He was looking at his apparent downfall from Michelin and competing guides at the same time as he was comparing himself to others that he saw as rivals, that he saw as being on the ascendancy, and that he saw as being those who would haunt his mind as being better than he was. During all of this, Bernard Loiseau did not stop to think about the Michelin guide itself and, and what it really meant. He was putting it up on a pedestal at all costs. And he wasn't thinking about the fact that this is the very same guide that was invented in the 1920s simply as a marketing gimmick for the Michelin company to get more people on the road and to sell more tyres. He wasn't thinking about the trivial background of this particular metric that he had held as godlike and the main thing that he could count for his success. But indeed, it was these thoughts of Michelin metrics and his comparison to others that drove him to be a shadow of him former self. And in the early 2000s, he was documented as saying, whilst running his kitchen, c'est jamais gagné. The battle is never won. It's never won. And in 2003, he couldn't cope with that anymore. And like Paul Ehrenfest, decided to find his own way out and take his own life. He couldn't bear the thought of failure or these comparisons with others. So with those two stories, two of the four pictures, we've learned that not everything that counts can be counted. And from that recent story, indeed, not everything that can be counted counts. Now let's take a brief sidestep closer to our own sector. I would perhaps be willing to bet that most of you here don't know who this gentleman is on the right hand side. That's Eugene Garfield, someone who's actually termed in many circles as the grandfather of Google. He was a giant in the field of bibliometrics. And it was he, in fact, who pioneered what we now know as journal impact factor. And it's not just pioneering journal impact factor, 
but really documenting ways that would help librarians decide which journals to host and university libraries in which to discount. But even he, having developed this for completely innocent reasons in the 1950s, has saw what the likes of Impact Factor has become and the poison that it can be for us if we misinterpret what it truly means. And from his own words, Eugene Garfield said this, the term impact factor has gradually evolved to describe both journal and author impact. It is one thing to use impact factors to compare journals and quite another to use them to compare authors. This ambiguity often causes problems. Now that is an understatement and one that for now we won't explore in depth, but I challenge you to look at stories in our own sector of people who have been consumed by not the Michelin guide, but the metrics that we could argue are the, are the equivalent for us. We in the sciences can be consumed by the same sorts of numbers and the same sorts of comparisons that if not properly managed, can lead some of us to think worse of ourselves than is the reality. So not everything that counts can be counted. And now we see that not everything that can be counted counts. And the last of these three messages for you today is to beware of your environment. Arguably the most important, but the most subtle of these messages. So let's put this in the form of a story and an analogy that we can use Think about the army and think not just about the army, but two divisions within the army. Those of the Air Force or the Air Corps and the military police. Now, the pilots in the, the, the Air Corps, they have more money, more chances for promotion. And the police, by comparison, sadly, don't have as much money and fewer chances for promotion. So the next question that I would want to ask you, we start with what I would hope would be an easy one is who is more satisfied in their role? Is it one, the pilot, or is it two, the police? Are you more satisfied if you've got more money and more chances for promotion? Or are you more satisfied if you've got less money and less chances for promotion? Now, again, I'm not proposing to put this up as a poll, but something for you to think about, whether you're by yourself at the moment or in a small group watching this seminar. Who's going to be better off here? Is it the pilot or is it the police? Now, when you look at this in more detail, brings us to another scientist from the 20th century, Samuel Stouffer. He wasn't a, a, a chemist or a physicist, but was a social scientist, a sociologist, in fact. And he said, a person's attitudes are not absolute but they are relative to some kind of level of expectation. If she does not attain it, she may feel a lot worse, even though she stands at a higher level than a person who has a lower level of expectation and attains it. The key point there is that a person's attitudes are not absolute. And in fact, what I want to show you now in reference to that question that I've just asked you about the uh, pilots and police is some data that was actually collected along the lines of what seemed like an analogy when I first posed it to you. Now, here's some cartoonized data that I got from a study called The American Soldier, which Samuel Stouffer led during World War II. On the left is data about the police and on the right about the pilots. And when they were asked about their chances for promotion, 56% of the police were positive and 42% were more reserved. But look at the data for the pilots. They're worse. Only 30% of them counted their chances as positive for promotion. And 70% were worse. They were more reserved. But it gets stranger still because if you look at the subsection for those who had a higher level of education. Within the police, now only 27% found their chances good for promotion and 73% were far more reserved. And again, the pilots were worse than anyone. The higher educated pilots, if I can put it that way, only 19% of them saw their chances for promotion as being good and 81% were more reserved. 
Now, remember, the pilots were the ones who had more money, more chances for promotion. So why is it that they, no matter whether they have a lower or higher level of education, feel worse off than the military police who had less money, arguably poorer conditions, and fewer chances for promotion? This is utterly backwards. It should feel strange to you, and it's something that I still wrestle with a lot. It's very hard to understand but it relates to what Samuel Stouffer says. How you see your expectations is relative to some standard. The military police compared themselves to other military police, not the Air Corps. And those in the Air Corps, the pilots compared themselves to other pilots. How you compare yourself is local rather than global. So even although it seems like the pilots have the better chances in life, let's say, to them, they're looking at other pilots around them who might get promoted more often or faster than they do, even although overall that group has better chances for more frequent promotion. When you're in that group, it might not necessarily feel that way. And that's why you end up with counterintuitive data like this, where the group who seem to be better off actually feel worse about themselves. And now we can take that even further. Let's go away from World War II into the education sector, where I have some more data from you from an entirely different study. Let's look at this graph of the x-axis being some measure of family wealth that can be low than the, you know, the average or high. And on the y-axis is a measure of academic self-concept, how you feel about your academic ability. And what you can see from this first data, which is badged with what I've called here a high-end school, a wealthier school, or a better-ranked school, you can see that the, the low- and medium-income families feel about the same, and higher-income families, the student feel better. But the lower-end school has a higher overall level of academic self-concept, and that's how the students see themselves. If you look at the same data when the teachers measure the student's ability or how they see the student's self-concept, you can have the same breakdown of family on the x-axis, but now when the teachers measure the students in the two different schools, and the, the high-end school and the low-end school, they actually see the students in the high-end school as having a higher level of academic self-concept. Now, there's a ton in this, but here's the thing to take away. Just because you find yourself in a place that gives you more opportunity, might be more prestigious. It doesn't necessarily mean that you individually are going to feel that way, that you're going to feel great about your abilities, that you're going to feel that you're worthy of being there or that you can do well, even although your ability and the truth of your academic ability might be entirely different. This is why you have to beware of your environment because your environment can either heighten or lower your own feelings of your academic ability. And this is why all of this has been badged as something where we can feel like little fish jumping in to shark tanks. This is why anything that we do when we make our next move in our careers can feel like going from a fish pond into a shark tank. Because we have to consider our environment as a major factor in how we feel about our abilities. So not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that can be counted counts. And we absolutely have to beware of our environment. So I hope those three messages will stick with you. I hope you find it useful and I hope you can see why I am bringing this message to you from what I mentioned earlier and my own struggles with comparison. And I really don't mind telling you at this late stage that over that 15 year period of my career, I have felt no worse than when I've been sitting comparing myself to other academics around me, looking at their papers, their citations, their H index, the journal impact factors of where they publish. Looking at all of that stuff is when I've felt at my lowest. And that's why I have to take my own medicine here and understand those three tools for myself. Now, before we finish, those of you 
oh, those of you who are still here, still paying attention, may notice that I seem to have broken my promise. I haven't connected all four of the images that we started with. In fact, I've only told you stories about the Solvay Conference, World War II pilots and a three-star chef. I haven't said anything about what I have controversially said might be a terrible 2006 Christmas movie, Deck the Halls. And I mention this because it is the season after all. This is one final example that if you're flicking through the channels while you're taking a break and you see that this movie's on, don't ignore it. It's questionable as to whether or not it's enjoyable. It's a nice family movie. Some of you will like it, some of you not. But what you will see in that movie is examples of those three tools that I've shared with you. Danny DeVito and Matthew Broderick are utterly obsessed with the number of lights and how bright the lights are on their houses. That They forget that none of that stuff matters. They, they forget that not everything that counts can be counted. They forget that not everything that can be counted, the lights in their house, actually counts. And they're not at all aware of their little suburban environment being something that they should be aware of as something that's actually driving this stupid rivalry in their behaviour. They don't see these three tools together, but I certainly hope that these three tools can be as useful to you as they have been to me. And that really does, this time, I promise, bring us to the, the end of this part of the seminar. What I've put up here is a QR code that you can scan. That will take you to a web page that hosts the earlier seminar I mentioned, uh, mentioned at the start, one that goes into the background of the imposter syndrome in more detail and looks at three different tools to manage the broader aspects of that, where today we are focused specifically on comparisons. So at this point, I'll hand back over to Charlie. As he's said at the beginning, I want to stress now, I'm really, really keen to take each and every question that you have in mind, hopefully now, but also later if needs be. I'm open to answering and discussing anything, and I hope you'll come forward with that. I'm looking forward to an excellent chat. But one more time, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to be here. I consider it a privilege. And thank you once again. Cheers. Charlie. Perfect. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, it was an excellent talk. Uh, I learned a lot and, yeah, hit home a lot with things you were talking about. Um, so thanks again thanks, for thanks, Charlie. giving the time to talk and to uh, everyone who attended, uh, especially with how busy everyone is. It's really great that so many people could attend. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, there's a Q&A box at the bottom, um, which you should be able to type them in, or you can message in the chat box if that's easier. Um, so we've already got a question in. Um, so lovely seminar, Mark, thank you. Do you think there are things institutions can do rather than just individuals that can help with this and broader mental health problems in academia? Yeah, Kate, that is uh, an excellent question. Um, excellent because it's a tough one to answer. Institutions are always going to be torn between what needs to be done to appear competitive and what absolutely needs to be done to take care of everyone who works or study at that institution. And that's why I think a message like this needs to go to leaders as well as individual individuals, as you rightly point out, because it's having a message like this and the awareness of these psychological and sociological phenomena in the heads of leaders that can hopefully start a discussion within leadership as to how better balance these dichotomous worlds of showing that the university is competitive and what metrics to use there versus how to show that message such that you're not throwing people into a pit of despair when they shouldn't really ever be there. So I hope that makes sense to Kate. Kate, if there's anything else you want me to say to elaborate on that, just fire another question in the chat but I hope that makes sense to you that it's a difficult one to answer because the incentives can in certain ways be driven in two different directions at the institutional and the individual level. Um, okay, whilst some questions come in, I have quite a few 
Um, Lovely. No, okay. Glad um, so I feel like for me anyway, when I'm in the lab or doing research in general, I tend to compare myself, not just with papers, but working hours, how much I enjoy chemistry, all those yes. kind of things. I feel yes. like there's so many things you can compare. Do you feel like you have any advice to give someone who maybe sees someone working really hard and thinks it's because they enjoy chemistry more, whereas often there's other things at play? Indeed. The, the last part of what you said is the most important. A lot of the times there are other things in play. Uh, now, I will come back to the working hours thing in a moment, but um, seeing that other things are in play has been something that I've had to develop quite seriously over the past few years. When I started my postdoc position, moving from Strathclyde to Edinburgh, I utterly obsessed about the new group of people I was working with and went straight to thinking they were all better than me and that they would work longer than me or read more than me, enjoy it more than me. And it took much longer time, actually, more in reflection than in real time to see that for each and every person in that team, their life story was different. How they got to the same group was an entirely different journey for each and every one of us. Our upbringings were all different. Everything that we've been exposed to is different. The fingerprint of a person's story is often so complex, is always that complex that that's why I think it becomes opaque to us. We forget about the subtleties, the nuance, the complexities of an individual and how they got to now and how they got to having a certain level of passion, let's say versus yourself, it's much easier to forget the tiny little details and focus on your assumption about things being a simple black and white story when that is more often than not simply wrong. Now you've mentioned in particular working hours and indeed there is a lot more under the hood there. Is that working hours because the lab culture demands it? Is it working hours because the individual demands it of themselves or are they coming from a competitive family background that they think demands it or are they genuinely there just because they want to spend more time there now you see that i've mentioned three or four different possibilities there and it could be mixtures of those or one more than the other but because of that in that simple example you can see that the answer is never really that clear uh, having said that, there are, there are some emerging uh, reports on mental health within academia and research spheres, spheres that show that you know many researchers do believe that hyper-competitive environments are, are driving some of these behaviours uh, and people don't like it. Now, there's more negative comment on that side of things than there is positive comment. So I think there is definitely some evidence to suggest that these things are driven at least in part by environment and and not just the individual Does that make sense charlie a really great answer thank you yeah um in oh there's a few questions that have come in um Excellent. firstly uh how should an individual deal with failure of a project for reasons beyond their reach when this puts you in direct comparison with your successful colleagues Redefine success. Redefine failure. One of the stories that sticks with me is in that of uh, inventor and engineer James Dyson of vacuum cleaner fame. He made, or he and his team made over 5,000 failed prototypes before they got to the one that's now making the cash. So he and many, many others with stories like that have had to be very comfortable with failure before finding something that is in fact a success. And I think this question is beautiful because it comes back to the previous question about understanding the circumstances and the situation. If you say that your colleague is more successful or they're able to get a project running quicker, you know, is that really because they're more successful or is it because the nature of that project enables a different level of output you know so some projects might allow for uh, more frequent publication outputs for example others will demand that you wait longer 
some projects, uh, in fact, st younger students who I've mentored who have gone on to PhDs have had per arguably the most difficult case of all where even if they have had a successful project, they're not able to publish it because that success is going into a different sphere, namely commercialization and spin out technologies where everything by its nature has to be IP protected and can't be shared the way that we in the academic sphere would commonly metricize success. So let me bring that answer full circle. Probe what you define as success and redefine your relationship with failure because the best successes come from being comfortable with repeated failure again and again. And one thing I'll mention in relation to the other seminar, which I've linked here in this QR code, is that I make uh, a big song and dance about not having just a CV, but a CV of failures. Charlie kindly mentioned a lot of my successes in the beginning and the most recent fellowship that I've got. But if you even take that one example alone, I've now got a CV of failures page on my website that shows you that I've had countless job applications before that where I didn't even get an interview, let alone get a chance at the job. I've been told hundreds of times that I'm not good enough. I've, been, I've had many cases where I've thought that my ability to write applications was better than it was and I couldn't see at the time that I just needed more practice. Failure has had to be the number one thing I've been comfortable with to get anywhere close to the sorts of things that Charlie mentioned in the beginning. And that has probably been the toughest thing of all, is to see every failure actually as just a baby step along the way to something better. Thank you, Mark. That was a really great answer to that question. Um, there's another question. Uh, so do you feel there are specific things we can do in a research group i.e. in terms of language or actions to create more of a community environment rather than a comparative environment for new students, i.e. so they might feel less imposter syndrome. And I guess kind of to add on to that, in terms of is can we do more in terms of not using specialist language, which I feel like can alienate people and that kind of thing. Hope yeah, that, that does come into parts. One thing I've found in... Uh... You know, I've been in several different teams at this point in my own career. And one thing that really struck me when I heard it for the first time was the first time I'd heard a group using we as the commonplace over I. Because I think when you do something even as simple as that, you instantiate the norm as being the team working together we got this project over the line, we contributed these parts to this thing, this whole that is greater than ourselves, this, this paper that might not have been anywhere near as good had it been on our own. The, so I think doing things like that can help to, sh to at least impress that not all projects are individual. That will never come across as black and white and neither as it should because you know a lot of people take great pride and in saying things like i've had a single author paper in this journal and there's nothing wrong with that either it's simply a case that as in most of these circumstances it's not black and white there's shades of gray in between there's nuance to consider there's nothing wrong with celebrating a single author paper so long as you're not holding that up in the, the pedestal as the only measure of success. So if you use language like we in the group rather than I, it can help encourage perhaps more collaborative projects than you otherwise would assume on day one when you don't know so much when you walk into the group for the first time. So that's the, the main thing I'd say. Charlie, you'd, you'd added on something to the end of that. Can you remind me what that was? Yeah, sorry. Um, just in terms of, um, I feel like especially when you join a group, it can be quite overwhelming with sometimes complex, specific scientific language. Yes, that's enough. right. Yeah. Um, you know, this perhaps comes back to the first story of the, you know, unfortunate physicist Paul Erdenfest, who, for many different reasons, comparison being among them, couldn't really see that his golden 
offering for the community was how well he could teach uh, verbally and in the written form. And uh, an ability to teach in part is being comfortable with stripping back a lot of the jargon in the beginning and giving people the lowest possible barrier to entry and not scaring them away. I think a lot of the time as scientists we can feel really good about our expertise by throwing around the jargon when in fact to show a bit of leadership and bring people into the fold and help people take the first steps towards mastery in a certain field the counterintuitive thing might actually be to use more lay language. Certainly, just to tie this off, I wouldn't have been able to do it as well as I think I do now if I hadn't had you know, one of my positions, my PhD funded by an organisation that was led by as many non-scientists as scientists and indeed more non-chemists than chemists. And in fact, when things like that PhD position and related travel funds were going through application processes, the most important part of those applications was not the main bulk talking about the science, but was a little 300 word segment that went before that, that being the lay summary that introduced the science and its possible impact in a way that anyone could access without a single note of jargon being within those 300 words. And I think if you take seriously something like those 300 words at the start of an application, as much as you take seriously the big bulk of an application, that can be a, a very powerful step towards other things like being able to teach better or to give new students in your group, as you've mentioned, Charlie, uh, a less intimidating introduction to what they're going to be contributing to over the next three or four years. It's perfect. Thank you for being so honest and open in your answers. It's very refreshing um, to hear your perspective Absolutely. Thank you. on all of it. Um, so there's another question. Um, so I work in an interdisciplinary field and find myself working with different subject specialists who are much yes. more knowledgeable than myself. Yes. Do you have any advice for being in this position of feeling ignorant because you just can't know it all? Oh, oh wow. Um, um, dear anonymous attendee, whoever you are, I feel that I could probably spend the next three hours talking about this on its own. I won't, don't worry, <laughs> but um, you're, you're not alone. There is a divide in mindsets, if I simplify it to two, between those who like to be specialists and those who like to be generalists. Those who like to be the jack or gel of all trades and those who like to be the master of one. And I think it's the case within academia that we certainly place more value on being the master of one rather than the generalist, rather than being someone who can actually be the jack or gel of all trades. And there's growing evidence now, and one of my favourite books on this subject is one called Range by David Epstein, who presents a lot of evidence for the generalist being the person who will be more flexible, more powerful as we go forward into the digital age and, and beyond that. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're feeling like you don't know anything in that position of being in a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary field, Try to worry less because what you see as a disadvantage now could actually become your own superpower. Working in a place where you're able to dip in and out of different disciplines could actually put you in the sole position of being able to bridge the gap and the knowledge between the specialists where the specialists themselves counterintuitively might not be able to see the connections that you might one day make. I hope that answers your question, anonymous attendee. I feel very passionately about that one because I feel more like the jack of all trades than the master of one. And it's taken me a long time to get comfortable with realising that's what I'm better at. <laughs> Thank you very much for that answer. I think it was very insightful. Um, I have a quick question if we still have time, maybe for a few more, course, if that's okay. Um, yeah. With... Um, imposter phenomenon and in general 
is there kind of a yeah, I feel like it goes very up and down in terms of my feelings towards it. Is there kind of a general yeah. theme in this or has that been studied at all? A general theme and in, in terms of like a tracking phenomenon. of people's feelings with imposter phenomenon. If it's uh, kind of okay. circular or linear. <laughs> yeah. Uh okay. So in our study, which is uh is just breaking four, four figures worth of contributors to that and by the way it's it's still open for if anyone here wants to contribute we've certainly found that when we try to quantify using known scales of imposter f experiences when we quantify whether someone has more or fewer of those experiences a lot more people are in the category of having a lot or uh, irregular periodic imposter experiences than those who have never heard of it or have never experienced it and don't have that as a problem in their lives the data is very much you know squished up towards one axis where uh, in fact people have higher levels of this experiences than than not and i thought at first that that was really just because the exercise the survey itself was biased but the longer we do it and the wider the demographic gets the more people that can be brought into it the more you see a consistency in that skewed or squished data, more people feel this way than do not feel this way. Which for those out there who feel alone in imposter experiences can be really quite the revelation and a big sigh of relief in itself. So there's the periodic experience which many people have. The thing that you say is circular, which I smile at, is because there is something known as the imposter cycle where many of us who are in a sphere like academia, who are high achieving within the intelligentsia, let's say, if I can put it more cynically, that, you know, there's the tendency to start off with a great deal of enthusiasm for a project, work through it, and as it gets towards the end, procrastinate a bit, fear the failure. But then when you actually do eventually get it over the line, you don't really stop to celebrate because you're worried that there's always more work to do. There's always another project. There's always something else you could fail at or be found out for. And the cycle begins again. You start that new project. You have the enthusiasm. Then you procrastinate. Then you get it over the line. Then you don't stop to celebrate. Rinse, repeat, start, end. And round and round it goes. Great, thank you very much for answering that question, Mark. Um, I wondered if I had time for one more question, if that's okay, before we wrap up. Absolutely, please do. Um, just in terms of your kind of two areas, your interest in terms of the imposter phenomenon and then safety, has there been any, are there kind of any implications of imposter phenomenon in terms of safety in the lab or general safety? I know you touched quite a lot in terms of people's personal safety in terms of very sad stories, but kind of day-to-day. Yeah. Wow, well, a, a very deep question because, um, okay, if, if you think of one element of the imposter experience being what we discussed in today's seminar, comparing yourself to other people, there is the danger that in doing so, if you're in a hierarchical environment like many labs are, then you might feel that you're not good enough to question someone's behaviour or you're not in the right position to question someone's particular practice if you see it as being unsafe, as, as you've asked about in this context. And a lot of that sort of thing has also been studied with the likes of airline pilots, where in more Western countries, there's less of a fear to, to for a co-pilot to question a pilot. But it was discovered many years ago that in further eastern countries, there was more of a hierarchy and co-pilots couldn't question the pilot if something was going wrong. And there's been a lot of work in that sector to try to level the playing field and make sure that you can question absolutely everything if it means that you are and you, the people in your care's safety is at risk, such as the same case as it, as it should be in our laboratories. No hierarchy exists when it comes to your safety. And that's something that we absolutely need to get out of our heads, that you can't question a certain person because on paper they might be older than you or a higher rank than you or have a different fancy title than you do at present. 
getting that out of people's heads is incredibly difficult and and until you mentioned it you know i had never really articulated it that way as as being able to connect that work in the, the imposter phenomenon and the arguably very different work in safety and i think that there presents an example of what i was trying to get across to our, our dear anonymous attendee in the previous question it can sometimes be that only by looking in different fields can you make connections that other people wouldn't ever see. So thanks for that, Charlie. You've got some thoughts spinning in my head there. Thank you for answering it. Yeah, it was a really great answer. Um, there has been one last question submitted. I feel I'd be doing anonymous attendee and injustice by not asking. Um, <laughs> of course, fire away. So they say, not sure if this has been answered, but mm -hmm. how can we actively try to stop feeling imposter syndrome? And I know you mentioned there was the talk you did the other day, um, which has the QR code. If you could make yeah. it just briefly. So yeah, certainly check out that seminar. There's, there's three other tools that I mentioned there for managing imposter experiences more generally. Uh, among many of those, one that sounds rather philosophical, a little bit cheesy, but nonetheless is the one that sticks with me more than others, I would say, is come to be acquainted with just how ridiculous it is that you're here at all. Understand that whilst many of your distant ancestors died, not a single one of your direct ancestors did. And if you look at the, the rough stats on the ridiculous odds of you ever being here, it's a number that none of us can understand. But in understanding the fact that this is better than a lottery win to be sitting here doing any of this, let alone fall out in a bit of the world that allows us to have a shot Having that in my head has been one of the main things that has got me over much of my procrastination and my loathful self-reflections on whether or not I should give anything a go at all. Keep in mind that it's more likely than not that you were never ever born and use that to look at your imposter experiences in a new light. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, there has been, sorry, there's been one more question which has been messaged in the chat box. Um, I think, I don't, don't know if it's just to me or not, um, but concern okay. something that I've had the privilege of not really having to think about too much. Um, okay. And is, um, people have said to, um, I think this person that they are only being given the opportunity to have that position to kind of tick a box in terms of diversity and how that kind of feeds into the feelings of imposter syndrome that, or imposter phenomenon that you are there just to tick a box in terms of diversity, which is a very sad question. Um, deeply, deeply. <laughs> okay. Firstly, I would say that the person, if there's someone who has said that to you directly, you should feel more sorry for that person than, than they apparently do of you. Because they're getting their kicks, sadist sadistically, I would argue, out of mentioning that. What's the point? What's the use? And then uh, by the same chord, think for your longer term, for your own happiness, let alone your success. Is that really the type of colleague that you want to have in your life? Um, are there not many other options that you have to hand? You know, there's a, a, a soup of stuff that we could get into here that obviously we don't have time for because um, there's nuance to the equality, diversion, the, uh, diversity and inclusion discussion um, that require more time. But in terms of that question, I think that's just nonsense that anyone has said that to you at all, quite cowardly, and something that if you can take a positive spin on it, you should use as fuel to prove them wrong. But don't, don't ever 
you know, go back to them and say that you've proved them wrong because that would give be giving them more airtime than they deserve, quite frankly. Just use it to get to where you want to be. As I've said in my other seminar, and as I say to anyone in any such discussion, especially on this one today of comparison, don't focus on you versus other people or you versus um, you know, some misinformed person who's said something as bluntly as that. Focus on you now being better than you then. Focus on figuring out how you tomorrow can get to the higher level than you today. The only comparison game that you will ever be able to win is the one where you're comparing you to yourself and not to other people, whether that's other people you perceive as being better or other people who are saying stuff idiotically just to bully you in their own way. Thank I you for that. Helps. That was a difficult yeah. one to answer. Yeah, I'm sorry for dropping that question right at the end as well. Um, thank you very much for answering it. Yeah, I mean, it's a very sad situation and there's yeah. been a lot of focus on it this year, especially with some of the stuff in uh, literature and on social media. So thank you very much for answering that question. Um, I think... At least I could do. Um, we'll try and wrap up there, um, if that's okay with you, Mark. Sure. Would it be possible Sorry. just to give a quick um, a bit of information for people who have missed maybe how they can participate in the survey you're running? Um, I've sent out the link in an email and we'll send up a follow-up one, but just in case anyone's missed it, um, that'd be Absolutely. great. Absolutely. So, yeah, well, whether it's a link in an email or the QR code you can see on screen now, um, that will take you to a page that has the first seminar. It'll also give you an introduction more fully to the imposter phenomenon study that I've been running over the past year. It will let you know how you, inside 20 minutes, can contribute to that study anonymously and um, also see how you can get some personalised information sent back to you in terms of where you lie on the imposter scale and contribute to a longer term part of this study where we'll be looking at um, a more in-depth analysis. And all of that, with your contribution, it's been made possible to try to dispel some of the myths of the imposter phenomenon and hopefully one day to stop us all calling it a syndrome when it's nothing of the sort. So if you go to that page, the seminar, ways to get involved in the study, some podcast interviews I've done uh, to answer other questions like you've asked me, all of that's now on one page and that will take you right there. The last thing I'll say, of course, is not, not just to thank you for your time as I've already done, but to thank you for that vibrant discussion. This is what really puts the icing on the cake of this sort of thing for me. And it's not possible without you coming forward, especially because they're not easy questions to ask in the first place. So I, I appreciate that on top of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again very much for giving your time to give the seminar as well and to answer all the questions that people had. Um, it's very much appreciated. And it's only me here, so I'll give a round of applause to everyone for the whole um, thing because uh, obviously it's a bit <laughs> strange um but yeah thanks again Lovely. thanks Mark. very much charlie um yeah and i would also wholly recommend taking part in the study i did it myself and was very surprised by my school so i would definitely say it's worth doing um yeah and hopefully after this everyone's learned something and can take something away um and if not then hopefully the recording will jig some things and i'll send that out um in the next week or so. So uh, finally, hope you all have a happy Christmas um, and get to rest some time over the break and can go home and enjoy times with your family. Uh, if not, then I hope you manage your best with the situation you're in. Um, yeah, thanks again, Mark. And thanks again, everyone who turned up today. Uh, very much appreciated. A pleasure. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.